All right, let's begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and uh, thank you for all of those that are gathered here and pray again for those that aren't with us, especially Bev, continue to be with her in her healing. Um, and we ask, Lord, that uh, be with Stephanie too in her continued healing. It's great that she's able to be here uh, even after her uh, foot experience. Um, but we ask, Lord, that you'd be with all of us. We never know uh, on any given day what it is that will happen, but we know, Lord, that you are constantly with us. You watch over us. You know the days of our life and you know the numbers of the hairs on our head. Uh, so great is your love for us and that you have provided for us not only each day, but you have provided for us in eternity. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of Jesus and the life that he gives to us, not just now, but forevermore. And as we live uh, in light of that, Lord, we ask that you would be with us as we study your word. As we know and understand our Savior even better, we ask that uh, your spirit would guide us and enlighten us and that our discussion together would be fruitful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We have the handout from last week still to finish, I believe. I only have like one. Uh, everybody have it. Mark 7, 31 through 37. Healing of the deaf mute. Okay, we were about halfway through, uh, so we just ended on the spit thing and said it's very unclear exactly what's happening. He does spit in other miracles too, so it is the thing, but in those miracles, it is described more in detail, like where the spit was, what he did. This particular miracle, it, it wasn't. Um, we did mention that there, there is in the culture or in the world at that time some um, superstitions with spit, but, but obviously Jesus doesn't need spit to heal. Um, he can just heal by his words. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, but uh, other than saying, huh, I, I don't know that I could definitively make any real things about it, um, just that it's there. So that'll get us into the second half of or, or I guess 34. So looking up to heaven. So we said that it was a posture of prayer. He sighed, or in some translations, he groaned. Um, this is a little bit interesting, too. Again, Mark doesn't say more about it. But if you go to page 30, uh, I have a few different examples of sighing or groaning. Um, one in Mark's gospel and one um, in Romans, where, again, there. Depending on the translation, it's either sighing or groaning. It's the same word in Greek, but um, kind of depending on what the significance is that's being attached to it. Um, is this a sighing um, that is simply a another description of what prayer is like sometimes? Um, so Jesus may not be saying words out loud in this moment. He can be praying to God, just like we often do silently, but... You know, you just you give that that deep, heavy sigh, which fits very well with the posture of prayer as as I often think about prayer. Prayer is conversation with God and the composition of that prayer, the content of it on any given occasion can be joyful, thankful, uh, full of praise, or it could be. Um, very heavy stuff, a, a request, a demand of God. It could be the confession of your sins to God, you know, could be a lot of different things. And depending on that content, your nonverbals, the, the, the way that you communicate is going to be very different. And in this case, sighing, it's, it's almost like Jesus is feeling the burden that this man is experiencing with his own malady, being deaf and mute. And so Jesus is, is in a sense, kind of taking that on him, but also in prayer, it is the releasing of that. You're, you're giving to God. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Talking about God, talking about Jesus. Um, in Matthew 11, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, uh, and I will give you rest. So it's again, prayer to me, one of the images of prayer is this releasing and giving over to God the things that that really bother us and and that would very much fit what's going on here 
Um, so that's one way to think about the, the sign. Another, uh, especially with the translating as groaning, that Romans 8, 22 through 23, Paul wrote, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So the groaning here is connected with the image of childbirth. And so some of you much better than I uh, know that childbirth is quite an ordeal. Um, but while childbirth itself might be a painful process and, you know, not necessarily something you look forward to, what comes as a result of childbirth is something that the joy, again, maybe I, I don't have the right to say this, the joy erases some of the pain or the joy makes some of the pain worth the experience um, because it's a far greater outcome. And Paul uses that to talk about the experiences that we have here on, on earth right now are like the pains of childbirth. They're, they're real, they're uncomfortable, but there's something yet to come that will more than make up for that. Well, the thing still to come, he talks about, is the redemption of our bodies or the adoption of sons which is the, the full picture of salvation. Not that we're not saved now, but we don't have the full experience because we still experience death, sin, sadness, sickness, you know, all of those things. Yes, we're saved, but we're, we're looking forward to all of that stuff going away. Um, and, you know, again, in, in pregnancy, you, you can feel the child growing in you. You have some of those joys, but the, the full experience is to be able to hold that child in your own hands. Um, and so in that way, this groaning is sort of like bearing the burden of sin, but also looking forward to in hope the, the ultimate, the renewal of all creation, the you know, getting rid of sin. And, and that kind of could fit this too, because Jesus knows what he's about to do. He, he's about to bring um, the sense of hearing and speaking to this man. That is sort of by definition, a renewal of creation that has been broken. This, this man is not complete. Um, he is affected because of the sinful world, you know, not pointing any um, fingers at him or his parents as sometimes happen in the gospels just this is what sin does and it's not good this isn't creation as God wanted it but Jesus will restore him to a way that he should be that he hears and speaks again and so the groaning happens just before the renewal of creation um, and so that that aspect could be here too Bob we understand that if our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we'll go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Will our name ever be removed? Because it said somewhere else, I forget the words, but our name would be blotted out. Mm -hmm. Can our name be blotted out out of the Lamb's Book of Life once we have it in there? Uh, the short answer, I would say, would be no. No. Yeah. The... the the Lamb's Book, the Lamb's Book of Life uh, does exists apart from time, our time and yeah. continuum. And so, um, you know, if, if, if one loses salvation, which again, L Lutherans believe that is, is possible to, to walk away from the gift of salvation that, that God would want to give to you, yeah. that, that you would lose it. Um, you know, we would say that person's name wasn't in the book of life as a result of their walking away from it. Um, but, but God would have had them in. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 co complicated, um, and, and hard to answer, but, um, we focus on the certainty of salvation as God gives, gives it to us, but it is possible like Judas to uh, turn from it. I can't see um, any reason to walk away from that. I, I, I would 
agree. <laughs> it's it, it is it is hard to fathom, but Satan can so deceive us. Because I just read that in the Bible. Yeah. Meditating at home, and uh, and that's puzzled me. Can, can my name be taken out? Yeah. No. Out? no, we 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 would orient ourselves to to Jesus and His promises, and as long as you know that those promises are for you, there there is no worry about that. It's it's those that say, oh, no, I, I I don't believe it. It's not for me or I don't want it, which is far worse. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so the sighing, the groaning, um, again, it, it does certainly show Jesus' love and compassion. It shows creation's um, travails, but also points to the renewal to come. It fits in with prayer. So there's a lot of different things that you could say of, of that. Uh, and then he speaks a fafta, which is not English. <laughs> uh, this is Aramaic, which is really weird because this gospel is originally written in Greek. So he records this in a different language. He doesn't, he uses the Greek alphabet to represent the sounds. He doesn't like start writing um, in a different script but he records the sounds that the, the words would have made. Um, but then he translates it. So he says, Ephaphtha, which, again, the readers, if they read Greek, they may or may not know the language this is from, which happens to be a language called Aramaic. Um, so he translates it, which sort of begs the question, why did he even include the Aramaic? Why didn't he just say Jesus said to him, be opened, you know, do, do the translating? Because all of this time, we sort of assume Jesus, okay, we don't know for sure what languages Jesus spoke. Um, clearly Aramaic, because this is in Aramaic. Um, that was the common language of Jews in that day. It was not their original language or historic language. Their historic language was Hebrew. Hebrew and Aramaic are very closely related, um, but they are different. So they use the same alphabet, uh, which to us looks a lot like Chinese. It's a, it's a um, script that doesn't correspond to our modern alphabet, so it looks different. It's just weird. But Hebrew and Aramaic use the same alphabet, not that differently than uh, English and German use the same alphabet, with a few exceptions. There's there's a couple of additional letters in German that aren't in English, but we use the same letters, but we pronounce them differently and they form different words. So again, to somebody that didn't know either English or German, but looked at an English book and a German book, they'd say, oh, those look very similar. That's what you would say of Hebrew and Aramaic. They look to us very similar because they use the same script, the same alphabet, but they have different grammar, different vocabulary. Um, they're probably, we could think of it if, did anybody learn Latin growing up? Yes. Okay, Latin and Spanish are very, very similar because they're historically related. Um, and so to me, I don't know really any Spanish, but if you showed me something in Spanish, I can read it pretty well because Spanish is so closely related and derived from Latin. Yeah. Speaking it and hearing it are different though because the pronunciation of things has changed over time and, um, and all of that, but they're very similar. So in our education, we as pastors learned both Hebrew and Greek. Aramaic, there's a very small portion of the Bible that's written in Aramaic. Um, we don't really learn that, but it'll be like a separate, like one hour course. And it's like a crash course in Aramaic. And it's, n it's not starting from scratch because it is similar to Hebrew, but it's like, okay, here's what you learned in Hebrew. Here's how they do that in Aramaic. You know, it's, it's similar, but it's different. So they're similar, but different. In Jesus's day, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but the people spoke Aramaic. So when they read in the synagogues, the Bible, the Old Testament in Hebrew, most people couldn't understand it. They're like, oh, that sounds vaguely familiar, but I, I don't understand those words. So they developed over time um, a translation in Aramaic or an explanation in Aramaic. 
So very often what would happen in the synagogues, they would read it in Hebrew, and then they would explain it in Aramaic. They'd kind of translate it for the people. And so Jesus did this in some of his own um, times in the synagogue, or, or so we assume, because to speak it in Hebrew, the people wouldn't have really known what was going on. So you have to put it in, in their language. But the other thing is um, Aramaic would have been mostly among um, the, the Hebrews, the Jews, the, the more world uh, cosmopolitan language of that day was Greek thanks in part to a man named Alexander the Great. When he conquered the whole world, he didn't just conquer them, he brought them the Greek language and culture. And so even here in Palestine and Israel, the Holy Land area, Greek was a language that united many different cultures, and it became the language of commerce. Even the Romans who historically spoke Latin, not Greek, they learned Greek because Greek connected them to basically that whole uh, Mediterranean basin that they took over um, the pieces that Alexander the Great left behind. Um, so this, this, is the, this is the million dollar question. So in Jesus' day, in this area, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin would have been out there, but the, the question is, what languages did people know? Well, if you were a Jew, generally Aramaic, if you were in commerce, Greek, because again, that's sort of the language that brings a lot of people together, and then if you were among the elite, definitely Greek and Latin, probably not Aramaic. Um, again, Aramaic would have been this inferior culture and their language and you know no 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 reason to do that so get back to the question that I asked what language or languages did Jesus know Aramaic seems to be obvious we know that Hebrew probably um, because he would interpret the scriptures for people and again that was originally done in in Hebrew however the complicating factor is Greek by this time the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, had been translated into Greek. So some of the people that knew Greek might have known the Old Testament not through Hebrew, but through the Greek translation of it. And Jesus has a conversation later on with Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate may or may not have known Aramaic. You don't necessarily have to know the language of the people you rule over. I mean, you have assistants. You have people under you to to deal with that stuff. You're just the the chief, the CEO, the boss. Um, But Jesus has a conversation with him. And we don't know what language that conversation was in. It probably was not Aramaic, though. It was either Greek or Latin. Um, We just... We just don't know. There's no attention drawn Why to it. Why would it matter to Jesus? He knew all languages. Yeah. Well, he's yeah. Second as a man, though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Jesus learned things, even though, yes, he is divine. That's one of the great mysteries of the incarnation. Um, yeah. That's a good point. Never thought of that. Yeah. So, again, but it comes back to this this weird thing of, like, why does Mark preserve the Aramaic and what, you know, who cares? What what does that even matter? Um, the short answer is I don't know for sure, but it does add like this um, lo- local color. We sometimes refer to it in literature of like this. This was a real thing and, and really happened. And and from time to time, like you hear Jesus's words directly. And Mark is noteworthy because he does it several different times, and I, I listed them all here on page four. He does it several different times where he includes something in Aramaic that Jesus says, and every single time he translates it afterwards. So on the cross, he also spoke. Aramaic. Yes, so that's one of the things listed here, right? So that's the yeah. Mark fifteen thirty four. Um, but it's it happens several different times in Mark's gospel. And so this is one of the things that's usually talked about. He, assu- he, he has, Mark has to be assuming that his readers didn't know Aramaic. 
Because otherwise, why would he have needed to translate it? Now, we asked the question, like, why, in, why include it in the first place, which is a different question. But the reason that he translates it to us would seem to be pretty certain proof that his readers, his original audience, wouldn't have known Aramaic, which then, you know, almost certainly would, would be able to, we could say his original readers were Gentiles. They, they weren't Jews. So, like, when you download all of that to your brain, that does tell you why stories about the Gentiles and Jesus' interactions with them would have been even more important to the readers because they weren't Jews. They were Gentiles. They were people like, hey, what has any of this stuff got to do with me? I, I'm not looking for a Messiah. I'm not one of these. But now you read, especially this section, where Jesus shows that he has come to bring the blessings to all people. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile or a Jew to Jesus. He has come to bring blessings to all of them. So this is sort of like the, the reading between the lines work that scholars do. And again, it may be, it may be a bad jump uh, to go from this to that, but it's, it's just weird otherwise. Why include Aramaic with the translations? Um, if the people know what it means, a translation is unnecessary. Um, so uh, there's there's a few other bits of like crumbs, breadcrumbs that that scholars follow. And so the origin story that is handed down through tradition is that Mark was not one of the original disciples, not one of the original twelve, but he was a. Um, I don't want to say a follower of Peter, a companion of Peter, um, and heard Peter tell these stories. And Peter, who was a Jew, would have known Aramaic. And so he could have been telling these stories in Aramaic, and Mark was the translator of them. Um, and again, you know, thinking of Peter telling these stories out loud to people maybe there was just like a way that Peter said these words. They're just like, Mark's like, yeah, you, you just have to hear the words in order to know. Uh, yeah, Jesus said, be open, but he didn't say be open. He said, Ephaphtha. Um, and, and Mark captures that. Or with the little girl, I say to you, arise, Talitha Kumi. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't. I don't know that there's like any big theology here that you know you're supposed to get out of it, um, but it, it's the reality of of what happens. Also, I, I was reading something recently um, about a Jewish uh, uh, colony mm -hmm. that was in Egypt mm -hmm. um, prior about 400 BC. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about taking uh, directions from Jerusalem and so mm -hmm. on. But anyway, there was all these languages indicated mm -hmm. because the whole area of uh, there, uh, the Holy Land, was a crossroads, and it was mm -hmm. a lot of commerce yeah. going back and forth between the Syrian yeah. section of the uh, the of the area and, yeah. and the Egyptian. Yeah. So there had to have been a lot of people knowing a lot of different languages. Yeah. And my again. If you ever if you ever talk to me, my idea of people is that we're dumber than we used to be, um, and and yeah. so l language learning for us, and we're Americans too, right? So it's it's fairly common for most of us to be monolingual that we only know one language. If you're good, you might have picked up another one along the way, or bits and pieces of another one. But most of us are not fluently bilingual. That's that's. Uh, an un-American thing versus Europeans, mm -hmm. most of them, like um, when yeah, I went to Germany, those kids learn English at a really young age, so they speak it almost with no accent. The Dutch frequently know five languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have to. Because yeah. They're a commercial. Oh, yeah, one. yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, people of that day, like we shouldn't put on them our own thought of like, well, they could have only spoken one because like they didn't have schools or whatever. Like you don't need schools to learn a language. Okay. Um, it, it, especially if you are involved in commerce. So this is one of the, again, suppositions that's thrown out. Jesus's human father 
Joseph was a, a carpenter, which was a, a trade, and he would have traveled and had to deal with people, so he he might have known more than one language, and Jesus would have learned that in the home growing up. Um, also, and when he went to Tyre, the woman there was a Syro... Phoenician. Phoenician, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they didn't speak Aramaic. Yeah, it's again, it, it's it's hard to know. Aramaic wasn't just the by the Jews, but Tyre is certainly more associated with the Greek influence yeah. than it is the Aramaic influence. Um, yeah, it's it's just it's hard to know languages. People write dissertations on that topic of like what languages <laughs> because it is one of those like unanswerable questions that you can always like find new little bits of nuggets or like hey when Jesus said this this sounded a lot more like the Greek translation of the Old Testament than the Hebrew, ergo Jesus probably was speaking Greek at that moment. I mean, it's entirely possible. We'll, we'll never know. Um, what we do know is the miracle of Pentecost. Uh, Babel is yeah. <laughs> undone. And uh, in heaven, whether we're speaking a language or many languages, we'll all be fluent and understand one another. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's all restored. Uh, I do know Jews sometimes talk about uh, the language that God really speaks is is Hebrew. Like, that's his original language, right? That's their superiority. And uh, as somebody who loves Greek more than I love Hebrew, I'm like, no, if, if, if Hebrew really was his language, he wouldn't have given us Greek. And Jesus came, and Greek is the New Testament. But um, we just tease about that stuff. <laughs> All right. Just say that to be- nerds, nerds, nerds. <laughs> Ephaphtha, that is, be open. What is it that is being opened? His his ears, his sense of hearing. You remember, he's going to, um, he sticks his fingers into his ears as he's doing all of this. And his ears were opened. And that's the, the miracle. But the miracle isn't just the, the, the physical process. It's everything that comes along with it. So we're talking here about languages. How do you speak and know a language that you've never heard, right? Because you're deaf. You've never, you, you only learn a language by hearing it, and he hasn't ever heard it. So he doesn't even hear the words, or to him it would just be gibberish, right? If you walked into a room and they're speaking a different language, it would just sound like gibberish to you, but the words do exactly what they say, and he speaks plainly. He speaks the language. So, yeah, these miracles of restoring um, to, to somebody who's paralyzed that they can walk, again, that, just, that doesn't happen. If you've ever been laid up, you know that your muscles atrophy and you need time to get back the strength. But these people don't do that. They go from never walking to... They're, they're jumping up and down, right? They're walking, they're carrying things, right? So uh, you have to understand that the miracle is, there's multiple levels of it, um, and, and it's just amazing, which all of the people there would have understood too. It isn't just, hey, this guy can hear again. It's like, he hears and he speaks. <laughs> how, how does that happen? How does he know the language? It's, it's Jesus's words that do all of this. Um, so 35, his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Um, the, these exact words qu- quote or allude to uh, prophecies of the Messiah coming, which um, I quoted a few different times uh, on your handout. Isaiah 30, so on page two, I have it um, in one place. I think I quote it again, but go to page two. Isaiah 35, 6 says, Then shall the lame leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. That's from a section of Isaiah that's talking about the, what the Messiah will do um, and what will happen when the Messiah comes. So again, that, that the tongue of the mute sings for joy, that the deaf hear, that the blind see. All you need to do is know the Bible, know the Old Testament, know the prophecies, see Jesus, and put it together. Again, Jesus doesn't just say, hey, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ. He says, look at what happens and know that 
I, I'm, I'm doing all of these things. I'm fulfilling all of the, the prophecies. And then you'll know it's, it's really me. Um, so all of that's happening. But again, here you have this kind of confusing thing. Verse 36, <laughs> Jesus charged them to tell no one. However, interestingly, the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. Now he's done that several times. Yeah, several times. Don't tell anybody. This, this time is among the Gentiles. And so, again, you're supposed to note, I think, the differences of he did all these things, or the similarities. He did all these things among the Jews, and now he's doing, like, the exact same things among the Gentiles. So his ministry among the Jews began with casting out a demon. What did he do with the Syrophoenician woman? Uh, cast out a demon from her daughter. And then he, produ- he um, had different miracles that had to do with the physical body. Um, the, the leper, um, paralysis, again, different, different ones. But here, it's it's another miracle in that class. So he's healing a man who's deaf. So there's a physical healing. And then late, later on is the feeding of the 5,000. Well, the next story that we may get to is the story of the feeding of the 4,000. And so, again, taking what we just said, Jesus' ministry among the Jews is now being mapped out among the Gentiles, and it's the exact same. So just as he told the Jews, hey, don't tell anybody, he's telling the Gentiles the same thing. So it is a repetition of that ministry, and he's not doing anything different with them. He's not treating them different. So just as he told the Jews to keep this quiet, he's doing the same thing with the Gentiles. But it was, but it was different with the Jews because he, was, he didn't want the, uh, um, the government to uh, get him just yet. He wasn't ready to go. Yeah, that, well, that was one part of it. I, I, I've said I think there's several nuances. So a second part is among, among the people in general, not just among the leaders, there were a lot of messianic expectations, but many of those messianic expectations were that there would be a physical kingdom set up. And Jesus had no intention of doing that. The kingdom of God is God's eternal kingdom. Um, and it does have a physical showing, but it, it exists beyond this world. But what would be his reason for saying this to the Gentiles? Well, because the Gentiles, although they don't have the messianic um, baggage, they do have their own understandings of what it is that they're looking for in, in God. Um, so, for instance, the, the Greek mythologies, um, they have their own stories of what salvation might look like and what the gods uh, are going to come to earth to do. So there's many stories of Zeus coming down to earth, and frequently the purpose of him coming is to procreate, yeah. ha- have, have more offspring, right? Je- Jesus, Jesus is, so they would, they would have their own set of expectations, and until you get to the second part of the gospel where Jesus predicts his passion, the story about Jesus is incomplete. So he never wants people to get the incomplete story. He only wants them to see the, the big picture. Um, and so you just... This, this isn't don't tell people ever, it's don't do it yet. You know, ho- hold on for a little bit until you see everything. Because yeah, um, our religions nowadays, they want you to tell everybody. Yeah. You know. I mean, a parallel maybe is you're, you're reading a good book and you think you know the ending of it and you're telling people and then you finally get to the end of it and you are way off in what you thought that book was about. There's a, there's a dramatic twist in the story, um, but you told people and they're like, oh, I read that because I thought it was about that and you said that and then, boy, was I disappointed or boy, was I surprised. Um, yeah, but, but it certainly is a theme in Mark's gospel. You see it again. I just think it's interesting that he says, don't tell, but the word gets out even more, which is how this particular story began. Remember, we have the Syrophoenician woman in foreign territory. She comes to Jesus and she seems to like know stuff about the Jews and Gentiles. Where did she get that from? Well, again, people have been sharing and spreading the news. It, it's it's just going to happen. Even the dogs eat the crumbs on the Yeah, 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 yeah.
Um, and that was like the first act. This is the second act of his um, encounters among the, the Gentiles. Um, so again, he, he tells them not to tell, but it doesn't, doesn't really make any difference. Verse 37, they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So again, a Gentile audience, you would expect if this were a Jewish audience, they would have quoted Isaiah 35. They would have said, hey, this looks like the fulfillment of what would happen when the Messiah would come. But as they're Gentiles, they don't have that background. So what do they just say? Like, wow, this this guy's really good. Um, It's it's amazing the things that he does. And he, he heals people. He makes people who couldn't talk, all of a sudden they can talk. People who couldn't hear, all of a sudden they could hear. Um, and so, uh, I have on page six, a few things that I say, you know, unknowingly there, there may be alluding to scripture or quoting, um, some things that we might have in the back of their mind. So he has done all things well. Well, that kind of reminds me of Genesis one thirty one. God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Um, so who's the only person that you could say they do something good? God. Yeah. Everybody else, there's always, well, that could have been better. <laughs> you, you could have done that a little bit better. But God, it's like, eh, that, that's a good job. Um, well done there. Ecclesiastes 3, 1, uh, 3.11. Uh, he, that is God, has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So God doing doing things in a beautiful way, again, a way that only God can. And then here is that Isaiah 35 again, um, with verse 5 also included. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. And then as we add verse 6, the lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Um, So again, the Gentiles, I I would not expect them to know any of these verses, but when they see what Jesus does, their own testimony kind of proves the prophecies. It kind of proves God's word and says, hey, this is exactly what Jesus is doing. Um, All of these things are signs of the kingdom of God, that Jesus really is in his own person bringing the kingdom of God in, in small ways. Again, it's that groaning in childbirth. There, there are signs of this new life here, even though we're not fully there yet. So we can look past what we see here to Revelation 21, Revelation 20 and 21, those, those pictures that John is given of what, what this will fully look like. So this miracle is is a sampling of Revelation 21, which will be the fullness. Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It's on page six of your handout. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. That's something that gets me. The sea was no, there'd be no oceans at all? No, so we, we've talked about I'm this. Wait, I forgot. Yeah, so sea is representative in the in, in a Jewish mind of, of chaos and evil. Oh. So remember the pigs? We yeah. talked about that. The pigs were drowned in the, yeah, sea, in the sea and Jesus walking on the sea. There's um, verses in the Old Testament that says only God walks on the sea because the sea is sort of, to us as people, an uncontrollable force and a source of um, Satan's power of, of chaos. Yeah, yeah so... No, because again, you look you look at the fuller picture. It talks about like the river of life and and streams. So, yeah, I think I think there's still water. It's just that that sea of chaos. There is no more because as you go go down, it'll get to that. Um, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, "Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man." He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. 
So this this is finally the birth. This is finally the full redemption. But Jesus' miracles, they're, they're always a reminder of Jesus has that power to do that. It, it's, it's not shown in the fullness yet, but it will be. But any of us, when we pray to God for healing, what we're asking for is, is just a little, a little bit more of that, a little bit more of that time and, and healing that he gives, even though we all understand in our minds that this life will come to an end. There, there is a time when God calls us to his nearer presence. And while, yes, we, we want that, ultimately, that is our true hope, we also enjoy the blessings of this world, um, family and friends and the experiences. And so, you know, well, we don't want to go until it's our time. And while we don't know our time, God does. And so we always pray, hey, you know, prepare me when, when I'm ready to go. Um, I, I do believe we will have peace. Uh, I've known hospice nurses who've experienced far more death than I have. I've I've been present when people have been dying or shortly after they've died. Um, but hospice nurses are around it all the time because it's their job. And one of um, the members of my church once upon a time said as a hospice nurse, she said, even not knowing biographies, not knowing people, she said, I could walk into a room and know who was a Christian and who wasn't. Mm-hmm. Because Christians, there was a, a sense of peace. Uh, even, 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 even though there was crying and, and all of that, there was peace. Yeah. But uh, non-Christians, it was always like just ter- why, terror. Why did, why did um, you do that? And, right, yeah. Um, and, and so for us too. Um, again, you, you may not be ready yet and it's not your time yet, but I, I do believe that when it's all of our times, God will give us that sense of peace about it. Um, not just for us, but for our families as well. Even though there still will be grief and sadness and all of that, there will there will be his peace not that always. he gives. Not always. Not and, uh, no. I, what I refer to as sometimes mm. an elderly death. Yeah. And a and a Christian elderly yeah. death and a peaceful death. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that the sadness is the same. Yeah. Well, I I, I will say for my own self, um, my dad's do- death. Uh, he died in 2019. Uh, it was it was sad, and I'm I'm sad not to have my dad here. But the nature of his health, like we essentially in in some ways had already mourned his death years earlier because of the dementia that he had. We had lost our dad um, you know a, a long you time ago, about. and so yes, there there wasn't the same. But his his death still marked the end of. The my kids no longer will see him anymore. They'll have no more memories, you know, beyond that point. So looking back to pictures, and that's you know that's it. And so there's there's still a sadness, but overall there's joy because he's not suffering anymore. He's with Jesus. We'll be together again, and we'll have all eternity to to catch up and share things. Did you have something, Bev? I, I was just going to say something very similar to what you just said about. My mother died of Alzheimer's, Mm -hmm. and she was gone to the family long before she physically passed. Yeah, yeah. And when she physically passed and we got the call, Donna and I, my sister, we we were on the phone, and we talked and laughed for a good 10, 15 minutes, Mm -hmm. remembering Mm -hmm. all the funny things Mm -hmm. Mom had done Mm -hmm. over Mm -hmm. the past. And we were glad that God had blessed her yeah. by taking her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember her mother walking, because I lived next door to her mother mm-hmm. and dad. Mm-hmm. And she used to go out for walks in the evening. And I went up to her one night and I said, I, I saw your your daughter at church and I was wondering if you'd give her if you'd give me her phone number, you know. And she said, Oh no, no, no. I ain't gonna do that. There ain't no way. I said, Well, I'll give you mine. Can you give her that? Mm-hmm. And uh, well, here we are. Did she phone? It, it the message got through evidently. <laughs> where there's a where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. Um, I, I I have I have I have done a lot of reading and mm-hmm. the, um, some of the uh, near life near near death experiences mm-hmm. are mm-hmm. are interesting. Mm-hmm. I, I think yeah. you said earlier you're not so sure about those things. Yeah. But they all sound awfully happy. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, again. 
we'll experience it for ourselves, but I I have myself encountered, you know, this with people that in in those final days, hours, minutes, it depends the different people it's been different. They they seem to have less of an awareness of this and more of of something yeah. beyond. Uh and yeah, I I None of that changes anything that I believe about Jesus, but it yeah. it would certainly kind of seem of you know Jesus is is coming for them and um, they're they're more aware of it, which again I think is the source of peace um, that they have. Yeah, which is better, sitting around with an ailment or illness, cancer mm-hmm. or whatever you know, mm-hmm. or dying and going to Jesus? Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's also the fear. Mm-hmm. A lot of people when they approach death. They look back and say, well, I haven't been so good. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they're thinking over what mm-hmm. they didn't want to think about before. Yeah. That may it. be a fearful thing for some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, but I, I have not witnessed death. Mm-hmm. But I have heard of a lot. I've talked to people who have witnessed mm-hmm. it. And there's, there's, there's many different ways to die. Yeah. And some of it actually is... Uh, there's, you could say afterwards it was a happy death, mm-hmm. it, even though you don't think death should be happy. Yeah. If you're approaching your creator and it's your ultimate goal, it should be happy. Yeah, yeah. the the uh, the the circumstances obviously, you know, every everyone is different, and um, you know, if it's if it's those where you're just kind of sitting by their bedside and you're just the chest rose, it fell, it rose, it fell, and then. It, it stops um, and it's just quiet like that and others it, it is a little bit more traumatic I will say mm-hmm. but it in, in any of that the peace of God is a peace that that surpasses all understanding, all understanding. and um, yeah it's so. the, the people left behind I think that we're describing when we say mm-hmm. it was not a, mm-hmm. they didn't like the death mm-hmm. I think the person that went is very happy to be done with it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to be said about uh, dying for people that have lived with sickness and pain and misery mm-hmm. for years and yeah. years, you know. Or say somebody that was in prison and finally found Christ, you know, mm-hmm. through somebody at prison. Yeah. And they don't care about bars and stuff anymore, you know. They won't have well, anymore. I mean, think think of the thief on the cross, right? The excruciating yeah. pain yeah. that is crucifixion. Um, and maybe he had his own fear about what was, you know, what was to come. But he he looked to Jesus and remember me, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so he he believed that Jesus had a kingdom. He believed that there was, you know, something good there. And even if that faith to us was like, well, he didn't he didn't know this, that, or the other thing. We don't even know what he did or didn't know. But he knew Jesus, and that was enough, because Jesus said, "Today you'll be with me," um, and. I I don't I I don't know how many people even though their whole life they showed no inkling to Christianity you know in in those last moments it was like a thief in the cross moment of like they see the end coming and they just say Lord save me and that's enough one thing that is sort of upsetting to me is when you see people that are really good good people good mm-hmm. folks you like to be with them and all that mm-hmm. you know, and talk with them and and they don't believe. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's sour, mm-hmm. really, that you go through mm-hmm. knowing that they're not going to make heaven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they wake up and there's a devil. Mm-hmm. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Don't want that. Mm-hmm. We want Jesus and he wants us. Yeah. All right, let's close there. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your great compassion and love that we've been reading about that is being expressed to the Gentiles and how uh, that probably shook up a lot of people in that day that that you O lord were not just the god of one nation and one people but of all peoples and all places and had come to save them by sending your son jesus help us lord to have your same heart and your same compassion that uh, as as Bob expresses, we we too would be brokenhearted over the plight of those that don't know you and don't know the the gospel of Jesus. And help us, Lord, to be people that would 
share that in word and deed because lord is as you want those people to be saved we share your heart and we too will want that we too will have compassion and love for them although lord we don't get to control the results and we don't compel anybody in order to come to salvation nevertheless help us in our own lives to show the hope and peace and confidence that we have in jesus in such a way that that others would find that compelling and would want to be a part of that as well. We ask, Lord, that that would be done through the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, next week we'll get into kind of, as I said, the last act of uh, this three-part series of he did this among the Jews, now he did it to the Gentiles. This Jews, this Gentiles, and the feeding of the 4,000. Um, in, in some ways, there's, there's not a lot to add because we did basically everything, and it's going to be very, very similar with the feeding of the 4,000, but we'll, we'll still find small differences to talk about. <laughs>